NET, the political news talk network. Coming to America. Why are some immigrant groups more successful than others? Tonight, one of America's leading social and political thinkers considers the culture of successful migrants. He says, enough with lofty buzzwords. Let's take a serious look at the value of what some call multiculturalism in our country today. It's Thomas Sowell discussing his new book, Migration and Cultures, and what it means for the debate over immigration in America. Good evening and welcome to Borderline. I'm Dan Stein, director of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. We'd like to welcome our newest affiliate to NET, Channel 52 in Placitas, New Mexico. Migration is as old as mankind. Throughout history, people have moved in order to fill some social or economic void. That certainly has been the case in the United States, but is it still the case today? Thomas Sowell joins us this evening to help us understand how migration has worked in the past and why it may become a relic of a bygone era. But first, a quick review of the stories making headlines this past week. Leading the news this week, a coalition of Florida citizens uh, say they want a ballot initiative in Florida this November similar to Proposition 187 approved by California voters in 1994. The Florida measure would ban illegal aliens from getting state welfare benefits. Rob Ross, director for FLA 187, announced in Boca Raton last week that the group already has 43,000 signatures, the amount necessary to invoke review by the state's highest court. Several hundred thousand more signatures are needed to qualify the initiative for the November ballot. A group of San Diego citizens uh, is igniting national interest with their newly formed U.S. Citizens Patrol. They're Americans who say they're tired of the federal government's unwillingness to control the borders. The brainchild of local radio personality Roger Hedgecock and activist Muriel Watson, the Citizens Patrol is monitoring Lindbergh Field in San Diego every night to try to convince local airlines and federal immigration officials that more needs to be done to try to stop alien smuggling through commercial airline flights. Because the airport is located just this side of the U.S.-Mexico border, International alien smuggling rings have been transporting aliens by land and then putting them on U.S. domestic flights for destinations across the U.S. Questions of deception surround an Immigration and Naturalization Service report that could have influenced recent, recent House and Senate debates on immigration. During a hearing last Thursday, Senate uh, Committee Chairman Lamar Smith of Texas questioned INS officials about misleading projections that immigration is on the decline. There was a general knowledge for the previous year in the research community that numbers were going up over time. The commission had spelled it out. That was part do, of our do projection. You, do you we had not made the projections that we had. Do you, understand later, how, had not made the do you understand how the person of the street would get the wrong impression by this release? Smith proposes making cuts in the INS departments of policy planning and public affairs and moving the statistics branch to the general accounting office. What motivates people to migrate? How do they wind up where they wind up? Why do some immigrants succeed while others fail? Why have some societies successfully assimilated immigrants while others have created enclaves of clashing cultures? Thomas Sowell's new book, Migration and Cultures, is a remarkable study of an age-old phenomenon that helped shape the world. Borderline correspondent Jacqueline Mitchell provides some background. I'm standing in the heart of Washington, D.C.'s Central American community, a community that did not exist until just 20 years ago. Today, several hundred thousand recent Central American immigrants live in and around this area. War, poverty, and rapid economic growth have plagued Central America for decades, driving people to migrate in search of economic opportunities. But what determines how immigrants behave? Why do some immigrants excel and expand economic activity, while others may become dependent on social services? 
basically the, the less educated, the less skilled immigrants go to where there are already high concentrations of similar immigrants. So um, you, you end up with communities that are virtually entirely composed of um, unskilled immigrants um, or, or less educated immigrants. The highly skilled immigrants, the highly educated immigrants, tend to disperse more widely. In his book, Migration and Cultures, Thomas Sowell says intergroup differences present not only an opportunity for cultural interchanges and economic advancement, but also for negative consequences, ranging from social frictions to the spread of disease to the disintegration of whole societies. Sowell traces several migrating groups and concludes some ethnic groups are better able than others to exploit economic niches and opportunities in their new country. Immigration responds to the needs of immigrants. Um, if immigration responded to the needs of Americans, uh, we would have very small numbers of unskilled immigrants, um, larger, no larger share of skilled immigrants, but a much smaller number of total immigrants. It is estimated worldwide there are 100 million people who live outside the country of their birth. While the motivation for people to migrate seems to be growing stronger, Country after country is deciding there's no corresponding motivation to absorb large numbers of immigrants. It's a new chapter in the history of immigration, and no one is sure how it will end. For Borderline, I'm Jacqueline Mitchell. Thank you, Jacqueline. There are no more unsettled continents waiting for humans to populate them. No new lands where people can shed the social and cultural baggage of the old world and start fresh. And yet, more people are trying to move in search of better opportunities than ever before. This book is a remarkable piece of research into why and how human beings have migrated in the past. And what about the present, and especially our future? Is the experience of the past, in this case, a reliable compass for the future? Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This book is really quite an achievement in tracing the history of migrations throughout the world. What would you say is the most important lesson it teaches us as we debate the issue today? Well, first of all, it, show, it says that there is no such thing as immigrants in general, that there are immigrants from different places with radically different skills, that every group has a very pronounced pattern, it has a pronounced pattern of skills. Uh, if you look, for example, among the Germans, you find them brewing beer in Germany and the United States and Buenos Aires and uh, Australia. Uh, you find them uh, in uh, you know, making lenses in Germany and here and other places. Uh, you find people settling. They don't even settle at random. The lady mentioned how there's a Central American community in Washington. That is very typical. Uh, people who move from Italy to Australia do not move from Italy in general to Australia in general. They'll move from one town in Sicily to one town in Australia. And a town a couple of miles away from that town in Sicily will send nobody mm -hmm. because there is not the knowledge built up there. And so the knowledge builds up in this one little Sicilian town about this one little tiny part of Australia. And that's where the people go. When a group transfers its culture from where the culture may have evolved to a new host country, what's happening exactly? Is, is the assimilation process not working or is there some balance? Well, how, uh, that also differs from group to group. I mean, there are some groups that come over and within one generation they've uh, practically disappeared into the larger society. Germans are, have had a very tenacious culture. When I was doing research for this book, I, was, I remember walking through a graveyard in South Australia in which every gravestone was in German. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, in the hotel you could buy the German language newspaper that was 100 years old. So, and of course they were brewing beer, needless to say. Uh, but uh, in other places they assimilate much faster. Well, what, what explains the remarkable persistence of some, some groups? No matter where they travel around the world, they seem to, to, to not only carry those cultural traits with them, but in some cases they're highly successful regardless of where they are. Well, well that, that, that's the great question. I'm still struggling to get people to admit that there are these patterns because the, the prevailing doctrine in social science is that the group is really the creature of the surrounding society, of the institutions and the biases and so forth. And so one of the key, uh, keynotes of the whole book and of my studies in general is that these groups have their own internal patterns. Mm -hmm. And you can see that very dramatically in many groups. So you identify some groups that seem to be successful. Yes. No matter who are they? You mentioned Germans. Oh, the, 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 the overseas Chinese who are fascinating because the overseas Chinese are successful everywhere in the world. The Chinese are successful everywhere in the world except China. Mm -hmm. 
And you can also say of the Indians that by and large they are successful everywhere in the world except in India. Is that because in India they're culture bound, for example? That's right. There, there are so many restrictions uh, on them. Uh, I remember an Indian businessman in California that's saying how he's visiting his son in Silicon Valley and he's trying to get him to come back to India. And the son won't go because uh, here he can move ahead on his own merit in India. They have more uh, quotas and preferences than we do and have had them longer. And he knows that if he's not with the right group, why then he's not going to go anywhere. And so he says, forget it. You'll stay here in Silicon Valley. Well, did you write this book because of today's immigration debate, or is it tied into... Oh, no, uh, good heavens. Yeah. I started this book in April 1982. Oh. So uh, <laughs> today's immigration debate was not the uppermost thing in my mind. Well, it, I assume you think it may have some influence on today's I would, I, I would hope so, um, because the situation, there are so many pluses and minuses. It's going to take some very serious thought to sort them all out. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the winning of World War II without having to land American troops uh, on the beaches of Japan, where they undoubtedly would have been slaughtered by the tens of thousands, uh, was made possible solely by immigrants who came over here and, and, and created the American atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the American space program and the Russian space program are both due to the German so, uh, rocket sciences. Uh, you can run down the whole list of things that have been created, the garment industry in the United States and many other countries created by Jews and so on. So and yet, yet you see the, the modern transportation today, uh, and modern communication, I guess, is having less impact on the transfer of human capital. It, the, the, the movement of people itself may not be as important. A exactly. That, that, that is now you can transfer the human capital, you know, by multinational corporations, uh, by the internet, by uh, sending people abroad to be educated. Uh, the bulk, most of the people who receive PhDs in engineering in the United States today are not Americans. A lot of people don't like that. <laughs> that that's right. Uh, Amer Americans don't have the education in many cases to, to uh, stand up to that kind of rigorous work. Well, we should explore that after this break. I think a lot of people want to know that. And also the question of whether we need immigration today in the 1990s and beyond. Give us a call. Thomas Sowell. I'm Dan Stein. 1-800-5000-NET with your comments, questions. Be more right back. Follow the bold march of freedom and prosperity throughout the world. Watch what the world is watching. Learn what the world is discovering. Every week, the struggle for freedom and democracy burns bright. Freedom's Challenge explores that struggle every Thursday night at 9 on NET, the political news talk network. So you've chosen to be your own boss. Running your own business means doing what you love, and doing what you do best, except one thing you don't love one bit, doing the books. Well, now you can say goodbye to your bookkeeping hassles forever, because the makers of Quicken have invented QuickBooks, the number one selling accounting software that makes it fast and easy to do the things you don't love doing, like paying bills, writing invoices, figuring out what your customers owe, even tracking inventory and doing payroll. QuickBooks makes it all hassle-free. How's this for fast information? A click, and QuickBooks shows you this quarter's income and expenses. And look, a few keystrokes, and QuickBooks does your invoicing for you, and then does the bookkeeping automatically. So you can get back to doing what you do best, growing your business. It's even easy to try QuickBooks. Call now to get a trial version absolutely free through this special limited time TV offer. That number is 1-800-308-9966. America on Track, your weekly connection to America's number one railroad, comes down the line every Friday evening at 10 on NET. With travel tips, great vacation destinations, route information, the latest upgrades, everything you need to know to stay on track. Tune in Friday at 10 on NET, the political news talk network. We want to hear from you. You can fax us at 202-544-2405 and email us at border at fcref.org. And of course, give us a call 1-800-5000-NET. Before we go to your calls, a couple of quick questions. 
Um, in your book, you note that some immigrant groups seem to have these persistent traits that no matter where they go, they seem to have them. Mm -hmm. um, why does that happen? And, and in a culture like ours where we're pushing assimilation, couldn't that interfere with that process? Well, I think the groups that uh, have a full range of skills, they have businessmen, they have uh, workers, they have the whole range, uh, they can have their own little enclaves. And in fact, the Germans and the Jews at one time ha had that kind of sy system. Uh, you could live on the Lower East Side of New York and you have your own doctors, your own businessmen, your own stores, everything, uh, speaking Yiddish every day without a word of English, and go on and live a lifetime that way. Is that good? I mean, is that well, it has its pluses and minuses. But if you have a group that is mostly unskilled workers, mm -hmm. then they have to work for somebody else, and they have to be able to under understand somebody else's language, and so it's crucial for them to acquire, to acquire the Americans, culture. Most Americans, I know most of the viewers out there, you would want uh, immigrants to speak English. Uh, most uh, most of the immigrants themselves want to speak English. What, the reason there's a controversy is that you have many activists, both from within the group and people in the larger society, who want to keep them foreign. But most of the, most of the immigrants themselves want to become Americans. Self-appointed do-gooders. Oh, you, you, you got it. I want to talk more about that. But let's talk to Dirk in uh, Navasota, Texas. Thanks for calling Borderline. Hello, yes. I have a question for Mr. Sowell. Shoot. Uh, Mr. Sowell, I live in Germany, and I've, I went there 10 years ago, and I'm an American. And when the borders fell in Berlin and we let East Germany be a part of West Germany, now we're all one, uh, we realize something that is basically happening with Mexico here in America. And my question is, uh, because of Yugoslavia and all of the other countries that are infiltrating into Germany, don't you think uh, there's a lot more land here in America, and why the greed? You, you lost me about greed. Well, I think um, what I'm trying to say is, if we're a land that in God we trust, and Jesus says, let the children come to me, wouldn't you agree that we need to open our arms to Mexico? No, because uh, every country has to protect its own borders. There was a time when every, virtually every country in the Western Hemisphere uh, not only allowed but encouraged immigration on a massive scale because they had the land and they needed the resources and so on. Uh, it's not at all clear that if you were to throw the borders wide open, let anyone come who wants to, that this would still be the same country 50 years from now. And so, uh, in a sense, you can't let everybody come to America, because if everybody came to America, it wouldn't be America anymore. So that, that's not an option that we have. Uh, the most we can do is try to weigh many very different kinds of considerations. Well, judging from the success of various groups in your book, who should come to America? How should we decide? Oh, I, I'm, that, that, that's a much tougher one, but I think that uh, we should say that we do have the right to decide, and if people who come here from country X do well and make America a better place, then let more people come here from country X, and if people who come from country Y simply come here and uh, become a burden on the American taxpayers, then less people should come from a country Y. One of the problems that we have uh, is that the welfare state makes it very expensive to let immigrants in. So you have a, you have a country like uh, New Zealand, whose total population uh, is less than that of New York City, you know, and, and they have all kinds of barriers against immigrants. Uh, you know, they've got 60 million sheep there and 3 million people, yeah. uh, and, and vast amounts of empty land. But the point is, once you put your foot on New Zealand soil, you're entitled to all kinds of benefits at the expense of the taxpayers, and therefore the taxpayers don't want you. So it's not just a question of the uh, number of people in the land, it's a question of what kind of system do you have. And one of Germany's problems, one of the reasons of, for the great hostility to immigration in Germany, is that they are a welfare state. If this was a place where you, sh you come in and it's up to you to support yourself, I suspect you'd have a lot less res resistant, resistance to immigration. Okay, let's talk to Paul in Springfield. Paul, thanks for calling. Thank you. Dr. Soule, um, I'm a big fan of yours, and I uh, urge you to keep up the good work. You just, uh, you're, uh, really uh, think a lot of you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess I have, have, have one premise, and um, then I guess uh, maybe two premises here. I, I think that it's important that, that for our sake of our national identity and, and, and for, for public policy reasons, I think that, that, that immigrants um, largely assimilate. They learn to speak the language, they learn the bourgeois work ethic and these sorts of things. And, and, and I guess um, kind of is, 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 is proof of, 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 of that is that um, before we had this huge welfare 
safety net. Um, immigrants who came here had to learn those sorts of things, and there seemed to be um, they seemed to be a, a, a absorbed into into American society uh, quicker, simply because of necessity. They had to become one of one of us, mm -hmm. so to say. And I would just you know, like your comments on that. Oh, absolutely, no, 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 no question about it. Uh, there, while some groups did retain their uh, languages and customs and so on, well, even the Germans eventually began to speak English. And once, once the younger generation came along and learned English, why then the whole group over time very quickly became assimilated. Uh, but again, it, it is the welfare state, and it's more than that, it's the so-called multiculturalism, which is really encouraging people to paint themselves into their own little corners and try to make it on their own. And that, that, that is one of the most horrible thoughts to me, because if there's one thing I've learned from the, all the years I've spent doing the research for this book, uh, it is that every nation, every great civilization has borrowed heavily from the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, the, the very paper that we use, you know, was invented in China. The letters came, were a, a Latin. Uh, the numbers came from India. <laughs> you know, you, you go through the whole list there. And what you're saying to, to various people is, you're to be off in your own little world and make it all on your own. And I, I just don't think that can, that can be done. No one's done it so far. Okay, when we come back, we remember we want to hear from you. Should immigrants be allowed to stay in enclaves if it makes them less competitive, more competitive? What do you think about that and multiculturalism? Give us a call, 1-800-5000-NET. Thomas Sowell, I'm Dan Stein. We'll be right back. To beat the stock market, you could spend thousands on these newsletters and magazines. Or you could have subscribed to Individual Investor Magazine, the one publication that beats them all. I like to invest in stocks that go up. Their stocks go up. For the third consecutive year, we beat the experts. Our Magic 25 was up almost five times the S&P 500 and more than 11 times the NASDAQ composite. I made a lot of money with Individual Investor. In terms of the stock market, there really isn't a better bargain than Individual Investor. This year, we've got an even better deal. Call right now, and we'll send you the next year of Individual Investor for just $22.95. And now you'll get this handsome digital clock radio. You have to be crazy to play the stock market without Individual Investor. To take advantage of this incredible offer, call right now. You have two choices. You can continue to be an average investor, or you can trounce the averages with Individual Investor. Call now for one year of Individual Investor, Magic 25 issue, monthly updates, and alarm clock radio for $22.95. Fact. With banks, you're guaranteed to never receive more than 7% on your money. Fact. So-called securities like stocks and bonds are far from being secure. Fact. With government-regulated commodities exchange-traded options, all of your risks are predetermined, but your profit potentials are unlimited. Fact. Right now, due to record export demand, a shortage is developing in grain supplies, creating opportunities that are staggering. Call Universal Commodity Corporation today for the facts on how $5,000 invested in the right market at the right time could turn into $20,000 or more in less than three months. Call now to see if you qualify to receive a comprehensive information kit that explains all the facts. There is no cost or obligation, so call Universal Commodity Corporation operations today and discover which commodities to profit from in the 90s. We're back with more of your calls. I got one quick question though. You make the point that some groups, uh, Germans, uh, ethnic Chinese, uh, Jews in the diaspora, I mean they do very well no matter where they go. If they assimilate in the host country, then they disappear. Why would we want them to assimilate if, they, if they're yeah, doing very, well? Very good point. They, they, they assimilate, and particularly the younger generation, in things like language, uh, dress, things of that sort, it's really in a sense superficially. Mm -hmm. The values that uh, make them successful, they tend to keep those values. Uh, and, and I think that, that that only enriches the country. So many of those so values are, are what, 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 what many people would call traditional American values that many Americans are losing. Mm -hmm. But the host country has a right to expect immigrants, if you will, to learn the language, to yes. dress in the national culture, and to assimilate to that extent. And, and, the, and the outward things, certainly. Okay, let's talk to Diana in Great Falls, a first-time caller. Thanks for calling. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Mr. Sewell, uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about, I actually have two questions. Uh, I have been really surprised that more black leaders have not spoken up uh, because basically it seems to me that it's the black people who have lost the most through job opportunities uh, with this unlimited immigration. I'll give you an example. I noticed this under the Carter administration back when I used to be a waitress in a restaurant. And we'd have a job opening, and we'd get 50 calls from, from Washington, D.C., from black people, you know, who wanted the jobs. And the, the management of the, the restaurant would end up hiring an illegal Mexican to do the work. And I thought this was terrible, whereas before the blacks were always getting those jobs uh, in restaurants and things. This has been, now you've got Indians, Pakistanis, all these different people have taken these jobs over and it's pushed the blacks more and more into this basically a ghetto existence, except for the few, the minority, who've been able to get out. And it's pushed them further into drugs and everything else. This should have been their chance, that, you know, with the, uh, the equal opportunity opportunity and everything to get up the ladder and to really assimilate into the population. It really hasn't happened. My other question, I spent a lot of time in uh, Central America, particularly in the Caribbean Basin, and all the blacks up there are immigrating into the United States. And what really shocked me is how quickly they rise up the economic ladder, very quickly become own their own homes and become middle class. All right, let's get a response. Well, I guess the, the first one, um, in some particular cases, which, what you say may be true, but there have been studies done uh, of uh, places where there's a heavy Mexican immigration, for example, and the un unemployment rate among blacks in those areas tends to be lower than it is elsewhere. There's not some fixed number of jobs from which the immigrants, you know, you subtract the number that go to the immigrants. Uh, the immigrants themselves create jobs, both uh, when they're employers and simply by the fact that they increase the, uh, the national output, which increases the demand and therefore uh, increases the demand for labor. So uh, it's not at all clear to me that the immigrants take the jobs away. What may happen in many cases, however, and in many countries, uh, is that the immigrants, because they come in, and particularly at the bottom level jobs, they prevent the wages from rising enough in those jobs to wean people away from the welfare state benefits. And so therefore we end up uh, su supporting native, more Native Americans because of the immigrants. We may not be supporting the immigrants directly, but they will prevent the, the, uh, the wages well, from all, rising. All of us have seen examples, though, of where we see an immigrant who doesn't speak very good English, and they've mm -hmm. got a PhD, mm -hmm. but they just got here, and they, they know eventually maybe they're going to make their way into, say, the engineering field. But in the meantime, they're going to wait tables. Yes. Because they know that it's only temporary, two or three years, mm -hmm. they're willing to work all day for a bucket of fish heads, basically. Yes. They're willing to work for no pay. Now, I mean, clearly, so for you, have, you have Americans who are just, they're not destined to go to college, or they're not destined to, 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 get, to go into the t technical fields for whatever reason. Doesn't doesn't the influx of that labor pool that's willing to compete on those terms erode the bargaining leverage of Americans who, in a sense, are looking to live a you know a decent life well, for if, thirty if years? Well, if they if they if they if, they if they plan to work all their lives at minimum wage jobs, which nobody does okay. hardly, uh, yes. But the very same things that allows the immigrant to start off as many of the Cubans did, you know, shining shoes and moving right. on up, will allow other people to start off shining shoes and move on up. Freedom means inequality. By definition, yes. right? Okay. All right, we got a lot of calls, and we'll get back to them right after this uh, word from our sponsors, Borderline. Be right back. The Wall Street Journal keeps you on the cutting edge with news and insights that can affect you personally and professionally. Subscribe now and have the journal delivered to your home or office. Now, with your paid 10-week subscription, you'll also receive our gift of two weeks free. That's 12 weeks of the journal for just 65 cents a day. Satisfaction guaranteed. Call now, 800-323-3600. That's 800-323-3600 for the Wall Street Journal. Capital Watch. From inside the Beltway out to America, NET's Capitol Watch is the hot seat of Washington politics. The congressman is voting on the House floor as we speak. This is live television, and he will join us again from our remote location right after the vote. We're not going to back down from this. We will not allow Washington gimmicks anymore. 
Capital Watch, politics while it's happening, every weeknight at 7 Eastern on NET, the political news talk network. The philosopher John Locke believes society should be governed by a social contract of obligations between society and its citizens. Today's runaway immigration threatens to unravel the delicate fabric of the social contract which holds America together. The Social Contract Quarterly Journal focuses on immigration, population, language, and social cohesion with in-depth reporting and fascinating feature articles. Call today and subscribe for the special TV rate of 1994. Golf Digest introduces eight ways to a better golf game. It can help you experience a game that's better all around. Get the eight ways to a better golf game video. It's guaranteed to improve your game, and it's free with your paid subscription. Order 12 issues of Golf Digest for just $19.77 now and get the latest video free. Call 800-544-6400. That's 800-544-6400. We're back with Thomas Sowell and more of your calls. Let's go right to Edmund, first-time caller from Fort Myers, Florida. Yeah, hi. What was the first question? Should we permit more immigrants? What was that? What's the question? Yeah, more immigrants? Well, how should we select immigrants? If we're going to take them, who should they be? My subject, uh, we should, for sure we should take more immigrants in, but the right educated ones. I do have my uh, son-in-law, his wife, and his son, they wanted to come to the United States, and they're highly educated. My son-in-law teach at the time on the universities in Germany. So he would not take a job, he would somebody who create jobs. So those should come in, and all the papers are ready, but because of the changing of the rules in 1964, the immigration rules, he is now on a wasting list and has to wait three years until he would be in line. Well, if we have those policies, that would not help us. See, after World War II in 1952, uh, yeah, there was a, a big exodus from Germany to the United States. Everybody skilled who came here brought this country up, and that vanished. When we changed the immigration laws in 1964 for and being just, the great society, what was pronounced at that time, so then everybody, we had to be just, everybody could come in. Well, more or less, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the immigration from Germany dried up anyway because Germany uh, had now enough work for their own people there. But uh, uh, still, my son-in-law is willing to come. He will be here in the next four weeks anyway on a university in uh, Blackburg, Virginia. So he, uh, by NATO, he comes over here once in a while, and uh, so they uh, make research. But he was still willing to come over here and lend his, his uh, capability to the United States. His okay. wife... His wife speaks four languages. His, the boy is in German high school, speaks already three foreign languages himself. So there should be something done. All right, thanks, Edmund. I, uh, I think he raises an important point, which is that in 1965, Congress put in place a law that selects now not on the basis of what you know, but, but who you know. And 80% yes. of the immigrants come just because they have a relative came earlier. And, and that seems to create this reinforcing pattern of immigrants coming Absolutely. from the same it, country. It, What's and, the and, 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 and it reinforces the culture. It prevents the people from uh, learning to speak English, having to learn to speak English. But this happens all over the world when, when you have this continuous movement of people in. What happened after the restrictions of the 1920s in the United States was that millions of people who are, had all the foreign languages and ways slowly began to assimilate, usually with the younger people first and so on. So that by about 1940, uh, you no longer had this vast number of people with foreign ways in the United States. Well, the 21 law also brought the numbers down, too, right? It brought, uh, oh, yeah, it brought the numbers way, way, way down. Well, now with the, you have the immigrant overload in these various communities, then you have the multiculturalism template over that. Yes. Is, that is that a threat uh, of some it, kind? Yes, because it, it, it systematically tries to keep foreign people foreign, even when they, uh, in the case of children, their parents, want them to become American. 
Let's so, talk to Howard in Howard in Cedar Falls, Illinois, Iowa. Howard, thanks for calling. It seems like everybody understands this problem except the people in the government. The government says drugs is the number one problem. But I hate to tell these people, but you give it a few more years, immigration is going to be the number one problem. We're being invaded right now. You can go to parts of Iowa, and it, you go into stores, and they're not speaking English anymore. The reason is is because of so many Mexicans here. This is getting ridiculous. This is the United States. If these people want to come here, fine. You, you've set uh, standards to where they have to learn English, they have to become American, and that they have to take and be able to support themselves. And they shouldn't be allowed in the country at all if they don't have a sponsor. Right, thanks, Howard. What, what are some of, the, of, the, of the, the threats which I think Americans are feeling now? I mean, they, but you identify in your book some of the threats that can come about. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I, think, I think the mere fact that uh, so much of what was once Mexico is now the southwestern United States is due to the fact that all the Americans settled in Mexico as immigrants uh, pledged to become part of the Mexican scheme of life, and after a while decided they didn't want to do that. And therefore, they took, took themselves and the land and joined it to the United States. So this can happen. Uh, you can have immigrants in such large numbers that they become a threat to the system themselves. Of course, the Roman Empire had that problem when the barbarians settled. Was well, that happening in California now? I mean, we're, we have some we have Mexican immigration coming in, mm -hmm. bilingual education. Oh yes. Uh, you know, uh, long-term bilingual ballots. Talk about non-citizen oh, yes. voting in San Francisco now. Uh, the Mexican government is becoming increasingly active in asserting. Sort of yes. Mexican, I mean, is, are we beginning to see? Yeah, some, I, some I kind think of the a tragedy is that uh, that. Uh, inst a lot of the immigrants, of course, come in illegally, which means we have no control whatsoever over, over what kind of people come in, other than those who are willing to come in. Well, what shocks me is that people who try to cross that border and are caught are turned loose scot-free to try two or three more times that week. Meanwhile, you're cracking down on businessmen who are trying to run a business, and you're trying to recruit them as law enforcement agents for, to enforce laws that the in Immigration and Naturalization Service is not enforcing. Well, what, what should it mean? What, who, who should determine whether someone's legal or not legal in the United States? Just the Federal Immigration Service? Yes, and I think, I think well, what, you, what you need is to get away from squeamishness. I can't believe that you couldn't stop this immigration from Mexico, for example. If you, if you dug uh, uh, trenches five feet deep in the earth and filled them with concrete so nobody could, uh, you know... Uh, you afraid tunnel. of the national ID card? I'm afraid of what it would be used for. Mm -hmm. and, but... I, but I, I hate to see a, a problem dealt with not by attack not by attacking those who create the problem, but by attacking vast numbers of other people who have nothing really to do with that problem. Uh, I'm afraid what will be done with a national ID card. But if you had if you had fences that went five feet into the ground and ten feet above the ground and barbed wire on the top, I suspect we'd get just a few high jumping athletes uh, coming into the United States. Okay, we'll take more of your calls when we come back. Thomas Sowell, I'm Dan Stein, and this is Borderline. If you're looking for job options and opportunities in today's tough economy, you need the nation's number one job search publication, the National Business Employment Weekly, the only publication that updates you weekly on top jobs available regionally and nationwide. All kinds of jobs, professional, managerial, technical, and you'll learn how to land one of those jobs by improving the way you write your resume and the way you interview. You'll learn new strategies for earning a promotion and negotiating a raise. And twice a month, you'll get the special Franchises and Business Opportunities section, the National Business Employment Weekly, at your newsstand now. Or call now and get eight job-packed issues delivered for just $35. Also get absolutely free the Job Search Guide, a collection of the best ideas to help you land a job. Call 800-221. 7600. That's 800 221 7600. The National Business Employment Weekly. If you're not looking here, you're hardly looking. One phone call can change your life. One call, and you'll have a Health Rider, the exercise machine that started a fitness revolution. The Health Rider will be delivered to your door fully assembled, so you can try it in your own home for 30 days. In just those 30 days with the Health Rider, you'll find that you'll look and feel better. Your clothes will fit better. You'll even sleep better. That's because the Health Rider gently stretches and tones every major muscle group in your body at the same time. 
So in just minutes a day, you get a full body workout. You won't believe what a difference that can make to your life. You'll have more energy, you'll lose weight, you'll build muscle. And if all that doesn't happen, just send the health rider back for a full refund. But it will happen. It will surely happen. So call us for information. Now is the time to feel good about yourself. To get off the diet merry-go-round and lose those pounds and inches. Call us now. The call is free. The trial is free. One phone call can change your life. Thomas Sowell discusses migration and culture. Give us your comments. Fax us at 202-544-2405. Email us at border at fcref.org. Or call us at 1-800-5000-NET. Borderline also has a website. You can find us at http double slash net dot fcref dot org. And once you get there, you'll be able to communicate directly with the pair's website as well. We're back with more of your calls. We've got Tom in Columbia, Crossroads, Pennsylvania. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Sol, I uh, am a retired uh, New York State government employee. I worked for the Office of Mental Health and Retardation. I began uh, working uh, in retardation, and um, one observation that I noticed is is that uh, if you look at the numbers of people in there, there were two major reasons we had uh, retar the retardation population we had. One was due to alcoholism. The other was due to inbreeding. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name the groups because that's that would not be correct to do. But they are people who refuse to assimilate in the general society, so therefore they do not marry outside of. The, I'm not saying they're they're incestuous or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. saying that they're just very very closed group. Uh, that's one observation. The other is is that again, I noticed uh, later later on I went on to work in a psychiatric uh, hospital with the uh, uh, assaulted patients, but I noticed that we had people, lots of doctors from all over the world. And uh, I remember there was a couple, Hindu couple, the doctor, uh, the, the husband walked in front, or the wife walked in back of the husband in her traditional Hindu garb. When I worked in retardation, we had a chief of service who was Hindu, wore her Hindu, Hindu garb, and we had a head nurse who was her uh, inferior in terms of, of her employment position, uh, who was Christian. And there was a little friction there because the Christian considered that she was freer and uh, more advanced than the Hindu who was uh, in a position over her. I'd like to hear your comment on all that. Thank you. Well, of course, you're going to have these frictions between groups, whether they're all born here or they come from halfway around the world. So I'm not sure that that's really a decisive um, uh, objection to, uh, to immigration. Um, the inbreeding, I don't, I don't know um, what groups he has in mind, whether they're current groups or some, some place back in history, because uh, when you have immigrants by the millions, uh, uh, you're likely to get a great deal more um, uh, interaction and, and not have that inbreeding problem. But I would assume that uh, you know, groups which view themselves as you know, cohesive and, and migrating and yet highly competitive mm -hmm. are going to feel, by definition, a strong social pressure to have their children intermarry within the group. That, that, that usually is the, the first generation or two. Uh, but, 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 but partly that's a language, a function of the language, as they, uh, when, they, when they're unable to speak the language, because the Jews were once concentrated wholly, almost wholly in the Lower East Side of New York, but um, immediately the next generation, they were up in the, in the Harlem and the Bronx and then out to Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco and so on. And so you no longer had that kind of situation. Now, that, that's a transient problem. Yeah, but it would be a problem, if I assume, if they just <laughs> yes. continue. Well, I, I can't think offhand of a group that's done that. All right, let's talk to Jean in Fairfax, a first-time caller, too. Thanks for calling. Uh, yes, first of all, Dr. Soul, is your crisis of vision still in print? Co conflict of visions? Conflict of vision. Yes, it is. Yeah, and where do we get that? Laissez Fair Books in San Francisco. Oh, we have that. All right, that's They have fine. an 800 number, which I don't remember. <laughs> all right, conflict of vision. In any case, do you think that, uh, that the school vouchers that are being proposed for some of the uh, inner city children would help to bring, you know, the immigrants as well as the other disadvantaged children into more of an American attitude or help them bring them up? 
I don't know, the, the voucher has a lot to recommend it simply because the public schools are so bad that it would be hard to come up with something that's worse. And so, and I think the competition would itself improve the public schools a lot. The fact that they have a monopoly is really the key to their mediocrity. Well, how, but, but how, I mean, how well can the children of immigrants be expected to do with such a high rate, given what's happening in American public education? Now, if you look at the children of immigrants 30 years ago, they seem to be doing fairly well. But mm -hmm. if you look at the, today's children of immigrants, they're highly concentrated in the, you know, in Los Angeles, mm. uh, Unified School District, and uh, in parts of Texas, Miami. They're not getting the kind of education, I would think, that would enable them to, to compete. Is, is that not true? I don't know, because uh, somehow or other the Asians come over and they seem, they, say, they seem to get the education and, and to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indians, are uh, people from India living in the United States have higher uh, incomes than the average Americans. So somehow it can be done. Uh, I have a friend who's in, living in a neighborhood where his kids are predominantly Asian, and his, his main concern is that his kids can have trouble keeping up. But he's happy that they're going to raise the standards so that if his kid gets C's, he will still have a better education than, than kids who are getting A's and B's in some of the other schools you elsewhere. You mentioned the anointed in your mm -hmm. book over and over again. The yeah. anointed yes. don't do a service to the immigrants. Who are the anointed? These are the people who think that it is their job to make other people's decisions for them, who believe either directly or through the government, uh, the liberal establishment, much of the media, the people who think that the, they ought to be prescribing community service for students and things of that sort. What, what motivates them? I mean, why are they there? Is it a oh, I think ego, perhaps. Uh -huh. That uh, there a disproportionate number of them come from elite. Do they understand uh, how wealth is created? Do you think? No, they have no interest in that. They, they think that wealth is created somehow, and the only interesting question is how they can use their superior wisdom to redistribute it. Nice. Okay, let's talk to Rosie O in Fort Myers, Florida. Thanks for calling. Yes. Good evening. Um, my name is Rocio, and I came from Mexico in 81. I came with the idea of wanting to integrate myself to the American society. I, I knew some English when I came here, and I have never lived off welfare. I have always lived a productive life. I got married in 1984, and then I stopped working to raise my four children. The problem that I have had is that when I listen to people that says, well, in this case, Mexicans should act like that, should dress like that. I am in a position that I have always tried myself to integrate to the society. And reality is that no matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, people will always put that barrier in front of you and they will not let you come in. So whenever I, I hear that they said, oh, but they like to live in, in their ghettos, speak in their languages, that is not true because I'm a, a, a living proof of that. And, of course, when it comes to people living off welfare, it makes me upset when even Mexicans, my own race, do that because I'm, I'm working for that and I'm paying taxes. But on the other hand, it is very sad that one day my children could listen a negative comment about uh, his mother's um, race just because the fact that she is Mexican. And so how do you deal with that? Okay. I don't know, but I, I must say that uh, living in California for more than 20 years, uh, I have never seen a Mexican-American begging on the streets. Uh, people uh, tell me that people on the streets you know, have misfortunes, and I say, do no misfortunes ever fall upon Mexican-Americans? Because they never go out in the streets and beg. Uh, they work. And I, I, don't, I don't think that there is this tremendously negative uh, picture of Mexican-Americans. I think that, again, the activists are pushing for the bilingualism and whatnot. And in fact, the activists make it a point to minimize the input of the, of the mothers and fathers uh, on, on school decision making. Because if you leave it up to the parents, the Mexican-American parents will say, teach the kid English. But you know, yeah, I, I see your point. And I, I, of course, I see your point. Uh, but now, if you have this big influx of immigrants, mm. and for whatever reason, let's say our economic system isn't promoting their income advance to the level that the self-appointed, the anointed expect. I mean, we saw with the New Deal, after the Depression hit, the anointed decided that because the immigrants weren't doing very well, we had to mandate equality through oh, the coercive yes. use of the federal government with the New Deal. Mm. Isn't there some danger with uh, you know, 20, 30 million immigrants coming in that we're beginning to see uh, you know, a huge new swath of unskilled labor in this country that, that even though the immigrants may not be begging, you may not mm -hmm, see yeah. the immigrants begging, that the anointed will in time 
use oh, their, no their status to, to well, push I, I through. Well, think, I think a major part of, inter, of immigration problems are caused by people in the United States who use the immigrants uh, for, for their ideological purposes. Um, there's no question about that. Well, we'll have to take a break. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And we also want to know what you think. Give us a call with your comments. 1-800-5000-NET. Please give us a call. Borderline will be right back. Direct Line. Live from Washington with Paul Wyrick. Probing, questioning, bringing the power players into focus, putting them on the hot seat. In order to get the votes, what did you have to give away? This issue is at the heart and soul, not just of the economy, but the values we have as an American people. Direct Line, weeknights at 6 Eastern on NET, the political news talk network. The men and the machines, the technology and the atrocities, the power and the horror of 100 years of war. The complete history of 20th century conflict, the century of warfare, now available exclusively from Time Life Video. Never before has the entire history of modern conflict been brought together in one comprehensive series. You'll see action you've never seen before and that you can't get in any store. So call now to get Air War for only $4.99. The Century of Warfare, exclusively from Time Life. It's 100 years of combat footage from both sides. Scenes that you can't get in any store. So call now before it's too late. 20 or Century of Warfare Air War video, call 1-800-469-1500. Call now or send $4.99 plus $3.49 shipping to the address on your screen. Direct from the nation's capital, right on Capitol Hill, starring U.S. Senators, Congressmen, and today's viewers, NET, the political news talk network with live and original programming that has America talking back to Washington. The Political News Talk Network, NET, is right for the times. NET is right for you. I think. We're back with more of your calls on Borderline. Let me take this uh, quick fax. Let me ask you this. It's from uh, Judy in Reston. Um, she makes the point that isn't it because of true because of welfare? Uh, and I, and I, would, I would add affirmative action, that today's immigrants have a lot less at risk or at stake yes. than maybe our ancestors' immigrants yes. 100 years ago? Yes. Uh, also because of the, of the nearness of, many, of the homeland. You see, when you had to cross the Atlantic Ocean, especially in an era when, when ships were sinking in the Atlantic, yeah. uh, you had to really want to cross that ocean, and you weren't planning to go back anytime soon. Whereas if you can pop back and forth across the border to Mexico or to fly out to the Caribbean and back, then your commitment becomes much more ambiguous. The other problem is with affirmative action, that you have people coming, uh, coming into the United States who are immediately entitled to uh, uh, set asides, uh, presumably to compensate for what happened to their ancestors who were never in the United States. That's, and that's why a lot of Americans in California are reacting negatively to affirmative action. Absolutely. You get right off the boat and you get a leg up. Well, and you have guys who come in with vast amounts of money, set up their own companies in Silicon Valley, and are entitled to preferential access to government contracts. Okay, let's talk to Rich in Coral Gables, Florida. Rich, uh, can you make it quick? Yes. Uh, my time. question was, uh, migration of sorts within the United States, uh, I came from Appalachian Mountains in eastern Kentucky 14 years ago, and a lot of people consider those people uneducated and I went to college, became a paramedic firefighter, and I've been in Florida the last 14 years. And that's my comment. My question was, I heard you on the radio show last week, Dr. Soul, uh -huh. and it was about, uh, you originally you said you were a Marxist, and then you became a conservative. Uh, oh, uh, yes. I wonder what influenced you to become a conservative. Uh, working for the government. Really? Yes. That's, that's what con convinced Milton Friedman, by the way. He was a liberal before he worked for the government. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Well, why, why, well, why, I mean, what do you, what do you, do you think, why, do you think that the, uh, the ideology uh, of, of the free movement of labor as it relates to immigration is picking up steam in this, uh, you know, in the Congress with the Republicans in charge? 
I don't know because the, uh, the these things go back and forth. The conservatives are split on this. The libertarians are, are gung ho for for it all. Well, you know, well, what about this? I mean, the, the libertarians don't think there should be any borders at all, right? That's right. That's right. Well, they Peter, don't think there should be any government, so therefore, they necessarily wouldn't be any, any borders. Well, so where's, I, that's the, going where's to the balance? Do you want to preserve your national culture? And your you you have to. Otherwise, uh, they, they would. I mean, the, the immigrants are coming here because of something they find here that they don't find in their own homeland. Obviously, if you allow this to become just like their homeland, there won't be any benefit to them, and it'll be a tremendous loss to the people who are already here. I, I see. Well, in, in terms of how the policy is being made in Congress today, if you follow the debates, is that being considered in the process? All sorts of things are being considered, including, uh, uh, you know, the slogans of the moment. Uh -huh. Well, I noticed you cite in your book Peter Brimlow's book, yes. uh, Alien Nation, with mm -hmm. some heat. Now, he makes the point that the rapid ethnic change going on through immigration is unprecedented in American history. Uh, that may be. I, I, I take that much less seriously than he does. And more importantly, I think the American people take it much less seriously than he does. Well, I, d I don't find the great hostility, for example, to Chinese and Japanese Americans uh, in, in this country that there once was. Japanese Americans. Yes. Well, but he raises some points that I think you agree with, right? That the yeah, because that that in in much of the literature they don't want to admit that there are any problems created by immigrants, but of course there are problems. I mean, the, the mere differentness of people will create problems, and if there is hostility, then of course you don't need h higher levels of hostility in the society, whether or not the hostility is justified. Uh -huh. Do you think it is today? Justified the hostility that's grown. The ho it's misdirected. It, there should be hostility toward those who are promoting multiculturalism and the, the welfare state. Okay. The book is Migration and Cultures. Thomas Sowell is the author. You can pick it up. It's in your bookstores now. Happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the impact of immigration and NAFTA along the border for the entire staff of Borderline. I'm Dan Stein. We'll see you next week.